Thank you very much. It's a real great pleasure to have been invited by the organizers, particularly as the Canadian representative of IANIS and uh, IAP. I have had the uh, pleasure of working with a number of individual uh, scientists from the Brazilian Academy who have made a major contribution both at the national and the international level. And I would like to congratulate them on their uh, contribu contributions throughout the world for what they have been doing for science at many levels. But the question I've been asked to talk about today is why insects? Um, this one is rather fun. I like them because I can wander around the world taking pictures of them. But any, it doesn't matter where you go in the world, you will find insects. In fact, when I left home to come here, uh, there weren't very many insects in my backyard, but believe me, they have adapted, and they will be there when I get back. And that is the one amazing thing about insects, is you find them everywhere with the exception of the high seas. So they are a problem. And if you look at the number of species, and this is a sort of by size as the number of described species, you can clearly see here that the insects outnumber uh, out, uh, the mammals quite considerably, which is why you can see them everywhere. There are very large numbers. And the thing is, humans, ever since they crawled out of the ooze, have been related with insects, interacting with them. And if you go through the mythology of many First Nations around the world, you will find stories that relate to insects. In nearly every First Nations in the world, butterflies are known as the free spirit, part of nature. So we've gone with them for, you know, as long as we've been around, they've been here a lot longer. One of the rather interesting ones here, if you go to the very ancient rock paintings in Australia, you will find here, this is Lightning Man. And Lightning Man, and this is the lightning rods that he throws, is a very important person in the mythology because when the storms come and the lightning comes, the rain is going to come and they must move. The uh, aboriginals move in Kakadu from the lower grounds up to the higher grounds. But if they don't listen to Lightning Man, his children come to remind him and this happens to be one of the children. This grasshopper, which of course hatches when the rains come, they come out, it's a further warning. So it is there insects have played a role in an important way. And actually if you pay any attention when you walk around the world today, you will find that they're everywhere as well. This is just a sample of bee ads. They advertise everything from alarm systems to beer and tea. Um, you can find bees. You can find butterflies everywhere for glasses, for banks. Why, why banks and butterflies? I haven't really quite worked out. And actually, if you're into tattoos, apparently, insects and bees, are tattoos are important as well. And as an ex-wine merchant, obviously, the fact that around the world, insects actually have a place in public awareness of uh, science by telling you all about them. But the one thing you will notice, we've heard about, we need to educate the public. Well, this is publicity. These are people that are doing publicity. Well, here's an example of clearly somebody had a science background. Here you have two ants that are saying, I don't know what Pete's playing at. She will eat him for breakfast, based on the fact, slightly incorrect, that um, praying mantis females always eat the male following mating. But it does show that at least they had a science background. And if you don't believe that one, how about this one? If you're bloated and ate too much, you feel like a caterpillar, but if you take x lax you will feel released and you can fly like a butterfly. So they've at least know about metamorphosis, which is wonderful. Now, did you notice something? Butterflies, bees, crickets, ants, are they the ones that we love? There are certain insects you never, never see in advertising. I've always thought it would be great that our truck runs as fa accelerates as fast as a cockroach when you turn out the light. But we don't like certain insects, so you never actually see them. And in fact, I was looking for a fly ad. Where do you ever find a fly? And sadly, the only place I ever found a fly was in a urinal in Germany where they ask you to aim at the fly in order to do it. So flies, we have a sort of a mental state about certain insects. But they really are important in our lives. As you've probably heard, 
you know, I mean, bees are extremely important. They are pollinators of nearly half of the food sources that we actually eat of our staples. Without them, we would be in deep doo-doo. We have insects that are recyclers. If we didn't have insects along with the microbes to break down the animal materials and the plant materials to recycle, we would again have problems. They are extremely important. And in half of the countries in the world, insects are actually rather good to eat. Now, I should admit that I have a problem. I'm an entomologist. I believe one should do all of these things. I happen to be allergic to insects, which is really rather sad. It makes it even worse that I work on plant-insect interactions, and I'm allergic to plants as well. Um, this is a bad thing. But I still love them because they are beautiful. If you, for those of you here, you will know this butterfly. This is the Morpho. It is one of the most beautiful butterflies in the world. And this one, the last time I was in Rio about three months ago, actually was good enough to sit down long enough that I could take its photograph. But when I say I'm an entomologist, most people say, what the heck's that? And then I say I work on insects, and they go, oh, goodness. Because this is the usual reaction to people about entomology. And of course, because of things like cockroaches in their house, you don't like them. A lot of people don't realize it, how important insects are from a negative point of view as a pest of many other things. For example, this is a cotton ball in um, uh, uh, Beijing, near Beijing, and you can see this one will abort, it will not give cotton. So they are a problem in agriculture. They are a problem in forestry. They eat the trees. They're a problem, and we heard a lot about this, in terms of vectors of diseases. And we heard about Zika, and we heard about dengue, chikungunya, one species, really a great vector for many, many things. I should say that this one, I let and sat, her, uh, sat there and let her feed on my leg. And I took pictures as she got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then when she had finished, I squashed her so that I could show students when I talk the reason why they are biting is not because they're vicious. You are a McDonald's for them. You are basically a food source because without your blood, she will not be able to develop her eggs and she will not reproduce. They're just not mean. There's a reason for this. What I didn't realize at the time, and I heard the next morning, there was an announcement on the radio that there was a major outbreak of dengue fever in the town that I was actually taking the picture in. <laughs> Apparently, I didn't get dengue fever, fortunately. The other thing is, I, I had to put this one in because this is a picture here, and you can see many termite mounds. The naysayers of climate change have actually said that in large part, it's nothing to do with man. Termites are the problem. They fart too much because they eat vegetation, and they're the problem. So they try and blame insects for um, our own problems. And in some cases, people don't like them because they're just plain ugly. This one is called a wart biter. Um, it's from Africa, and it really is not a very attractive looking animal. Um, I have to admit that I had taken a group of students, and I heard this one morning, um, Jeremy, Jeremy. And it was one of the students, I thought, oh my goodness, what's wrong? And he sounded panicky, so I'm running over, and he's lying down in bed, and he has this thing sitting on his chest. And he said, is it dangerous? Is it dangerous? I said, don't move. And he thought I was going to kill it. I ran away and got a camera so I could take the picture. <laughs> and then I forgot that he was about seven feet tall and would have killed me. Um, but anyway, he was nice about it in the end. But the thing is, what is a pest? I can tell you what a beetle is, and I can tell you the morphology of what a beetle is. I can tell you about a butterfly. What is a pest? Insects that eat papayas here are not a pest for me in Canada. We don't grow papayas. It is all a mental state, if you like. It's competition with us. Now, I put this one in because this is an epidemic of the spruce budworm in Canada. And the trees in Canada are not normally orange. We like Christmas trees that are green. But these have been attacked by the spruce budworm. And of course, it is there classified a pest because it is eating the trees that we wish to harvest to make lumber and to actually make paper and so on and so forth. From an ecological point of view, this animal is fantastic. It kills only old trees. So when the forest gets too old, they attack it, they get rid of the old trees, which allows the new forest to grow. 
This is important ecologically, but in our minds, no, that's not important. We want the big trees so we can cut them down and destroy them ourselves. It's sort of like old professors. If we don't get out of it, then the poor young ones will never get a job. But the thing is, although there are at least a million species of insects known, less than half of 1% are actually considered pests anywhere in the world, be it you know, in households, in grain storage, in forests, in agriculture. But in agriculture, they cause up more than 15% of the total yield is destroyed either in the field or after we've harvested them by insects. So they're ex that's extremely important. And when you consider this graph here, where you're looking at population growth over time and our ability to increase food production, you, don't, you notice they don't match very well, which means we are really going to have to improve our ability to produce food. I mean, it's not just where you produce it, it's getting it to the people that really need it, but this is one of the basic problems. So we need to get rid of the insects that are, we consider pests that are causing losses, or in the case of medical, for diseases. Well, the mainstay is insecticides. And it always has been since we got the, particularly since DDT and all of the new insecticides come along. And of course, you can run to the grocery store and buy these things and spray them in your house to get rid of cockroaches and so on. Not a great idea. You can also spray in this way, and here I might add this was in against the dengue in Thailand. I was sitting right over here having a coffee when this guy just came up and went and started spraying, so I moved. But I mean, there is a problem here. But the problem is, is we try to solve a problem and we end up in many cases with a much bigger problem. We have problems of resistance. For example, in the house fly, this isn't the house fly, this was a fly I was sharing a meal with in Australia. They say Australia is a great place, 10,000 million flies cannot be wrong, because there are a lot of flies in Australia. So basically, the house fly is resistant to over 25 different insecticides, and there is a, 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 a system called cross-resistance where when you treat them with one type of insecticide, they build up a resistance, so you say, oh, I'm gonna change for another one. And when you do, you find they've actually partially developed resistance to this one, even though they've never been exposed to it. So we have a problem here. The other one, of course, is the question of impact on non-target insects within the ecosystem. You've heard of colony collapse, I'm sure. The bees around the world, the colonies are collapsing. One of the aspects that has been uh, in, in the argument is the question of insecticides. There is no question, they do play a role. They are not the only reason. I'm not defending the insecticide industry here. I'm just being an open-minded scientist. You want to find a single solution. It isn't that at all, unfortunately. The other thing is many of these are hormone mimics and we're finding that you are getting like amphibians with only three legs and so on and so forth. So there are ecological problems. And there is even a problem, of course, at the level of the most important species, at least according to us, Homo sapiens, and with the insecticides that are either in the environment per se or if you eat the food. Um, in this case, it was only a graduate student, so it didn't matter. We could replace them, but, you know, for important people. But I have to say, we took this picture, it wasn't, it wasn't an insecticide, we were actually calibrating in its water, and um, uh, that was not a problem. But this is, the resistance, all of the problems, is a problem and we have a headache. But for a very long time, we were like these gentlemen here, we just stuck our head in a barrel and we didn't admit we had a problem. Slowly, thank goodness, we are now realizing that you cannot just go out and spray with insecticides. There are solutions to problems, ecological ones. Clearly, they wanted to increase the size of their house. They had a tree, you could cut it down. No, we just build around the tree. This is actually a very good solution. So we can do the same thing, and it's called integrated pest management. Now, pesticides still play a role, but they are the last resort. You try other things first, because we know what the problems with insecticides are. So you only spray insecticides if you know there are insects there. So you do things like monitoring. This is one example where you spot spray. Now I would point out from a health point of view, 
this person is not very aware. You will notice, one, that they're spraying and they have no protective clothing. You will notice they're also smoking. But, I mean, you know, there are idiots out there, and this is one of the problems where many cases insecticides have got a bad name, is people misuse them. You know, when in doubt, read instructions. But what we do use are, is biological control, and here you have a caterpillar that has been attacked by a wasp, and each one of these cocoons will give rise to another wasp. So by using the natural enemies, we can control the pest problem. We can also use um, uh, pathogens. Here, this is, a cap this is not one of these Q-tips. This is a caterpillar with a bad case of athlete's foot. It has been attacked by a fungus and will die. So we can use this. But if you think about it, if you ever have fungal things growing in your house, where are they? In places like the bathroom where it's damp. Because they need humidity. So fungi will not work in places in the desert very often because it's too dry. So you have to think of it from an ecological point of view. You can also use plant resistance. You can see very clearly this, plant, this plot here was a plant that the insects really liked. This one they didn't like the taste of. So we can use the resistance. But the other aspect that I am supposed to be talking about is chemical ecology. And very obviously, by its pure name, tells you it is interdisciplinary. You need the ecologist, that's me, who, quite frankly, every molecule in chemistry is what I call bimethyl chicken wire. There are all these little things with things sticking off of them. I'm not very good at chemistry. In fact, I got 51%, but it's saying I'm a chemical ecologist is a bit of a thing. But you'll notice, as the chair of the last session pointed out, ecologists do know about energy-saving clothing, and you'll notice boots. This is my colleague, the chemist, and you'll notice he's wearing house shoes. This is the difference, but we need each other. We just aren't very good in the other one's environment, but together we make more than the whole, we hope. And when I ask my students, what do you know about chemical ecology, they answer, nothing. You all are experts in chemical ecology in your own way. You know certain things you like the smell of, you like the taste of, you like the look of. All of these things, this is chemical ecology. Your dog teaches you chemical ecology. It isn't, of course it has to go to the bathroom, but the way it does it is marking its territory to let everybody know I'm in the neighborhood and to recognize who else is there. So if you are a chemical ecologist, you have to think, I want to use this for insects. How do they get information? Well, they're very much like human beings. And I thought I would pirate this as seeing as here. This is the human being. They have auditory, visual, olfactory, and taste cues. And they're all sort of located in one place. Well, insects, this is a real dragonfly, obviously. They have taste, but they're cleverer than we are. They can actually taste with their feet. Could you imagine at lunchtime somebody asks you, is there, enough sh uh, is there enough salt in the soup? You take off your shoes and dip your toes in and go, no, I need a little more. They are clever. They can actually do it with their backsides and everything else. I don't want to go there. The auditory system is exactly the same, although rather than being in one place, it can be on their legs, it can be on their thorax, their abdomen, depending on the species. They have visual, depending on the species, very good vision or very bad vision. And of course, they have the nose or equivalent of olfactory, which are the antennae. So here you have an example of a female gaining information. When she is touching with her uh, ovipositor, she can detect certain chemicals and knows this is a good place to lay her eggs, because this is a monarch butterfly, and she will only lay on milkweed plants. Of course, you all know the sound, a cicada. They sing. They can be a nuisance, but they're very good at communication. This butterfly here is called a peacock, and very obviously there is a communication system here by color, and the patterns, and the eyes. But it's two forms of communication. One is to the opposite sex going, aren't I really pretty? But the big eyes are actually signals communication to potential predators saying, I am enormous. Look at the size of my eyes. You wouldn't want to eat me. And then, of course, the one that we really are interested in is the olfactory one. And, of course, amongst the, there are visual signals. But this bee will be getting information on its antennae as it flies in from the odor which says, this smells right or it doesn't. So, 
as a chemical ecologist, how would I proceed? I'm an ecologist. And I work on uh, caterpillars like this. This one is actually lying to birds because its head's here, but it mimics a snake by having this large eye. But also this white pattern here is a disguise, and from a distance a bird will think it's bird poop. So it's telling all of the others, I'm not here. Or if I am, I'm a great big snake, so don't eat me. But if you poke it, you will get a violent reaction, and it rears up like this, and then extrudes these rather strange glands. And there is a very nasty smell accompanied with it. So I asked the question of my chemist, do you think this odor is a way of repelling enemies? So he said, OK, let's find out. So I call my friendly chemist, and he starts doing the analyses in the GC mass spec to identify what the compounds are there. Now, the first thing they will ask is, have you got a proper bioassay? Can you identify what compound, or can you test the compounds? Because if I identify them and you can't do anything with them, I'm not going to waste my time. So then the next thing, and this is an example here, of a, an extract of a gland, and you can see there are a very large number of compounds. Well, there's a problem with that. Which one? Which ones? What combination? That's a lot of peaks, and in some, you can get many, many more. But then what we do is we call our physiology friends, where they do electrophysiology, and test the olfactory system, how they respond to the different chemicals. And as you can see here, the same trace, these are the spikes that you get from the gland, but you will notice the antennae only respond to about six of the compounds, which means right away you only have to test the six, because if you can't detect the others, how the hell are they going to respond to it? So that makes good sense there. So then you do biotests in the lab, see what's happening under controlled conditions. And here's an example of a wasp that I work on, and the male um, approaches the female, waves his wings, and if she agrees, he jumps on and starts mating with her. And we were interested, where is the source of the pheromone? So what we do is we do extracts of the cuticle of the female, and then you put it in here with the male, and you look at the proportion of males responding and the time they take. And as you can see here very easily, it's clear that this odor that excites the male comes from the abdomen. So now I go back to my chemist and say, here's the abdomen, do this, et cetera, and we go iterations until we find it. But then, of course, your laboratory is not the real world. And this is one of the real problems for ecologists. We forget we do it at the, during the day when they actually do it at night, et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea here is now we have an extract. You put it in the trap, and we can see whether in actual fact and for example, here, we're looking at the, these are females and looking at the number of males responding. One thing it tells you, yes, they all respond, but there are differences between the individuals. So it allows us to do, understand some of the behavioral ecology. But we really do need the ecologists. This is a cornfield uh, near where I live. And in these stalks, there is a caterpillar that's overwintering. So this is the spring, they will now come out. It's called the European corn borer. It's one of the major problems in Europe and North America. And of course, where would you put your pheromone traps? Well, in the field, that's where they're gonna come out. No, it turns out after years of doing this, we discovered that these insects, when they come out, it's too dry here, so they go over into the long grass at the edge of the forest to mate. So we're trapping in the wrong place. So now we can put it in the right place and we can do it properly. So there are two types of communication. There are interspecific communication, and they're called alimones. This is a little skunk, and if you know anything about them, you disturb them, they will use a chemical message that says, please go away. And if you ever get sprayed by one, you certainly will go away, and everybody around you will go away, because you stink like hell. Interestingly enough, in Canada, uh, I, have a pair, I just got an email from my son who told me, Dad, a skunk has taken residence under your deck, so I will have to deal with that when I go home. But they're fine, as long as you don't disturb them. And I don't have a dog, because dogs are the ones that chase after them. They're really stupid. And every time, even when they get sprayed, they go back. 
On the other hand, cats leave them alone. So cats in that sense are better. But today I'm going to talk about the inter, intraspecific, the communication signals chemically between one species. And you've all probably seen ant trails going along. They're very organized because they leave a chemical trail along the ground. So some a worker will find good food over there. When it comes back, it leaves a chemical trail. So I will follow the trail. And then when I come back, I will leave it because the food source is good. But when the food runs out, when I come back, I don't leave a trail. So they can use it. So this is passing on information to members of your own species. So how can we use this? Well, as I showed you earlier, feeding. So this is a butterfly that is sucking up nectar. And they don't just feed on any old plant. They often feed on specific types of uh, flowers. And it turns out that Peter Landolt showed that in a number of moths, there was this compound here that is produced by the flowers that these moths actually go and feed on. So he said, I'm going to make an artificial flower where I bait it with this strong odor, I add sucrose, which is the equivalent of the nectar, but I lace it with an insecticide. And they did a series of experiments and showed that the, the moths did not detect the pesticide, they were attracted to the trap, they suck it up, and then die. And the neat thing is, they came to the trap, you didn't spray the insecticide in the whole orchard. So now you have got a level of control without having this general pesticide that could be only the, only the insects will come to it. Again, it hasn't been a great success in the field because of other things. Ron Prokopi, who is a very famous scientist who worked on this insect here, Ragolitis pomonella, the apple maggot. And the apple maggot is not something you really like because the female lays her eggs inside the apple and this is what you will get. This is one that one of my students gave me, a teacher gets the apple. These are larvae, obviously, and the apple is no good. The farmer cannot sell it, so they spray orchards a lot. Well, Ron said, well, you know, how does the female choose an apple? And the first thing he did was do a whole series of experiments in different types of trees, putting artificial fruits of different sizes. He also did different colors and discovered, not surprisingly, they love the color red. And they discovered what the color red was. Then working with other people, they made an artificial blend of the smell of lovely ripe apples. So how, how, when a female is flying, if the wind's coming this way, she will fly this way, and the chemical messages will come this way. So she's flying, she detects, whoops, she detects the odor, turns, and will now fly upwind. And she's flying up towards the odor source, and as she gets close, she sees this lovely bright red apple, and she goes, yes! <laughs> and she flies, and she lands on it to lay her eggs, and goes, uh-oh, uh-oh, because this is all covered in glue, and she cannot get away. Well, by doing this, they reduce the number of spraying in apple orchards significantly, but reduce the damage level. So this is understanding the insects. Another one that I would give is in British Columbia, where John Borden, um, Keith Slesser, and Cam Oschlager, they, these two are chemists. He's obviously the biologist, you can tell by the dress, um, and where they are. They worked on bark beetles, and these are bark beetles, and what they do is they attack trees. And different species attack live trees, dead trees, and trees you cut down, and they cause a lot of damage around the world. When they attack a tree, the tree can't run away, but it produces um, resins, which are a form of defense. Well, there's a way that the beetles have learned to overcome this. They recruit other individuals. It's sort of like saying, hey, come over to my house. I've got lots of pizza and beer. So you recruit people to come, and they use what's called an aggregation pheromone. So they use a chemical message getting other individuals to come and attack the tree. But of course, if I invite you all and I've only got one case of beer and one pizza, we're not going to have enough resources. So when there is a high enough density for the resource available, they switch and they then put up, we are full. 
they put what's called an anti-aggregation. Go away, we don't want any more people in our, in our house. And so you have these two. And they said, well, we could use this. And what they did was they went out and trees that they decided they would sacrifice, they put the aggregation pheromone on. So when the beetles came out, they went, whoa, there's a party over there. And they, Pow! they all went and attacked the tree and they had laced it with insecticide, so all of the individuals died. On the trees they wanted to protect, they put the anti-aggregation pheromone saying, it's full, go away, find somewhere else. And this has saved literally hundreds of millions of dollars for forestry around the world and in sawmills and everything else without using insecticides. We've heard a lot about diseases, and there is a lot of research going on now. If you go out with a group of people, there is always somebody who says, I get bitten much more than everybody else. Well, why? Is it because they are more attractive? Or are the other people producing a repellent? Or both? So what is, what is happening is that they are now trying to work out what it is. And you could imagine that eventually we will be able to have not just things like DEET and so on, we could actually be putting on compounds that are naturally occurring compounds that repel insects or stop you being attractive so they can't find you. And that would be a very good thing. Just working out in the field and looking at things, people, this, I don't know how many of you know it, it's Azadiracta indica. It's the neem tree. The neem tree has been used in India and in Africa for hundreds and hundreds of years. What they would do is collect the leaves, and when they harvested, say for example, the niabe, the chickpeas in Africa, they would put a layer of leaves, then some of the peas, then another layer of leaves, then the peas, and the insects didn't attack it. They didn't know why, any more than my ancestors used to put all their clothes in cedar boxes. They didn't know why, they just knew that the clothes moths didn't eat them. Well, they've now understood what it is. There's a compound called azadiractin, which is used as a botanical insecticide, and it is extremely important. Uh, the good thing is, for human beings, in, this is in Thailand, you can actually buy the flowers to make salads. We can eat it, and in fact, it's bitter. If you don't like bitter, then it's no good. And the other thing is, you can actually buy soap and toothpaste, because, of course, it kills bacteria as well. So it is a really neat thing, but environmentally it's safe because it doesn't affect a lot of other organisms. The other thing is communication between sex. I work on insect sex. It's really weird when you say, what do you do? And you say, I work on the sex life of insects. People look at you and do wonder just how weird you are. But, you know, everybody's got to do something. And what we work on in the applied sense is uh, the sex pheromones, and here you have this giant silk moth who basically comes out, hardly feeds at all, only lives for a few days, must mate and lay eggs. Well, how does she find her mate? Well, basically, when she is sexually mature, at the tip of her abdomen, she extrudes this pheromone. This yellow thing here is a pheromone gland, which produces an odor which is carried downwind, and the males will detect it. And basically, you can imagine it as a perfume. And each species has its own perfume. So one has Chloe, and one has Chanel number no. five, and one there has poison. But each, it's sort of like telephone numbers. You invite only those that you are interested in. And of course, I don't think that Chanel made a mistake when they did the ad where this is the name Allure, but then they just had this part as Allure. So, you know, buy my product and you can lure them in. Um, but that is what we want to do from an applied perspective. And basically, this is a male, and this is the giant silk moth's antennae. The male's antennae are much bigger. It's basically its big nose to detect the odor of the female so that he can fly upwind and mate with her. So, we identify the sex pheromones, and here you have this poor little male flying up to what he thinks is his girlfriend. And unfortunately, it's not, at least not for him. And in fact, when, when I had a reporter 
um, uh, in my laboratory asking about this, the article afterwards, he said they fly up when, and they die of frustration, which I, I had this image of imagining this moth having a depression because all it could find was rubber septa and no female and then dying of depression. But um, this is the one thing, getting things to journalists isn't always easy. But what we do is we use them in traps, and here you have the artificial female and a sticky trap, so we can monitor populations. We can monitor them if there's a new insect being introduced, and you want to know where it is and how far is it moving throughout the country. You can put traps out, and you can see, okay, we only find it around Rio. It must have been introduced here. But in three or four years, traps near um, uh, Sao Paulo are having them. So you know that the insect is spreading. So you can warn farmers, this is what's going to happen. The other thing, of course, is you can trap and then you count the number. And the insect, the one of the insects that I work on, the one that you saw flying up to the uh, rubber septum, is a species that cannot live in Canada. It's too cold in the winter, but they immigrate in every year. And in most years, we catch less than 10 males per trap per week. But every so often we get these massive invasions and you get more than 30 males per trap. That should be night, per night. And when you go like a 10, 15 fold increase, you warn the farmers. There is a very good possibility that you will have outbreaks. Look at your fields. If you see damage, apply insecticide or whatever. If you don't have the damage, do not apply insecticides. I was telling my students. How many of you take aspirin or something like it for headaches? And they all go, yes. And I said, how many of you took one this morning just in case I gave you a headache with a boring lecture? And the answer is, thank goodness, no, they didn't. So why would you spray? And this is one of the problems. People, you know, they used to do it the 1st of June, 1st of July, 1st of August, because it was the first of the month and we do this. Well, no, if it's not there, don't do it. You know, surgery is only necessary at the very end. The other thing one can do is what's called mass trapping, and this is a picture by a Brazilian who worked in uh, Japan, Walter Leal, and he identified a number of pheromones for these beetles, and this is the trap catch for one night. So could you imagine, these are, let's say these are all males. You can, all the females are out there going, where did George go? He said he was gonna call me last night. You know, have you seen Fred? So if you catch all of the males, then the problem is you're going to have a bunch of females who aren't going to have anybody to mate with. What happens then? No mating, no babies, lower population. Sometimes it works. The only problem is that more and more we're, decide, we're realizing there are an awful lot of males out there that actually don't mate anyway, and if we're only catching the duds, it isn't helping us a great deal. The other thing is called mating disruption. That sounds sort of sexy, doesn't it? This picture has nothing to do with insects, except it does. This is Von Romani, which is an area in France which makes some of the best wine that you can buy in the world. And one of the best Pinot Noirs is called Richbeau. Now, Richbeau, if you go online and try and buy a bottle of 2013 Richbeau from either of the Gros family members, this is how much you're going to pay for one bottle. This is an expensive resource, but they don't spray insecticides against the grape berry moth. What they do is they put out these artificial females that emit odor in the vineyard and also around the vineyard. So the example I could give you was if somebody walked in this room wearing a very strong perfume, and I said, who's wearing the perfume? We would all point to that individual. But if I put the whole room, misted it with the odor of the perfume, and the whole room is permeated, and then somebody walked in, you wouldn't be able to recognize who it was. And this is basically what we're doing. We make the clouds of pheromone, so the male's going out going, where the hell is she? And so what happens is, they don't mate. And just to give you an example from a friend of mine, Jacques Stackel, here is the number of individuals being caught in the trap per night in the vineyard prior to putting out the uh, mating disruption, and this is afterwards. Clearly, they are not mating. So by reducing the population, you reduce the damage, everybody is happy, and if you're rich, you can buy one of their bottles of wine. 
I'm not that rich, unfortunately. I love their wine, but... Uh, ah, transgenic plants, GMOs. Lovely subject, but I'm not really going to go there a lot. But imagine, this is a wonderful tomato. Because in North America, nearly all the bread that you buy is square. So you put on it. Do you know how hard it is to work out how many slices of a round tomato go on a square slice of bread? It's a pain. And also, they roll off. If you had square ones like that, it would work perfectly. The only problem is, I hate to tell you, this is Photoshop. They have not got to growing square tomatoes yet. There are a lot of other things. But we are now thinking about using transgenic plants in chemical ecology and pest management. For example, this is a Colorado potato beetle, and it started eating the leaves. Well, as you all know, even if you're not biologists, you know that plants cannot run away. <laughs> I haven't seen any yet. I'm interested. If you, if you know of one, please contact me. That would be a science paper. But they don't just sit there going, oh, I'm being eaten. They upregulate their defenses, but they also emit volatiles, odors. You know, the poem, poets talk about the odor of fresh cut grass. It smells different than not cut grass. The reason is the change in the volatiles that they release. Well, plants release different volatiles, and through an evolutionary process, the natural enemies can smell this change in the plant, and they're running around trying to find a place to lay their egg, which in this fly's case is on this larva. They fly in to the plant and go, there's a damaged plant. Where there is a damaged plant, there is a herbivore. That smells like one I could attack. Well, here's a cabbage. You wouldn't like that. But if you use, make sauerkraut, you wouldn't know. Just get the lumps of caterpillar out of it. Um, but basically, this is a problem. But these caterpillars are attacked by wasps. And these are the wasp cocoons here. This is the dead caterpillar. And a friend of mine, Junji Takabayashi in, in Japan, asked the question, can we manipulate cabbage plants so that when they're damaged, they upregulate the smell? So instead of, you can imagine, I'm a controlled cabbage. Help me, help me, help me, I'm being eaten. So he then did transgenics where he got a, a cabbage plant that went, help me, help me, help me, I'm being eaten. But he thought, that's not good enough. So he then got one that whispers. And then he released the parasites. And of course, the working idea was that the ones that shout would have more, um, more wasps would come in, so there would be fewer caterpillars. The normal ones and the ones that whispered wouldn't, would be eaten a lot more because the wasp didn't come. And in the laboratory, it worked a wonderful way. So we have approaches that can be really good. Now, am I? telling you that pesticides are bad and natural products are good. If I was writing a grant, maybe I'd lie. No, you shouldn't do that even if you're writing a grant. But you have to say why it is important. But I mean, if you're an open-minded scientist, you have to be realistic. It doesn't always work. You know, because it's natural, it's good. Uh-huh. Well, other than a few Brazilian presidents of the, this academy who used the low doses of this for cardiac things and so on, I would not like to bump into this lady and get bitten. It is a natural product, but it is not one that I would want. I might add, I was actually leaning down like this, taking a picture of an insect, and I saw this out of the corner of my eye, and the other person I was with said, do you see that? And I said, are you talking about that black and yellow thing about a meter away from me? And it was this, but I got some nice pictures, but fortunately I didn't get bitten. But I told you, we put out traps and we catch them. Well, this is the Japanese beetle, which has been introduced into my area. And the, the shops are selling these um, pheromone traps. And they aggregate, they catch the beetles. Well, the only way I would ever use one of those is if I put it in my neighbor's garden. Because basically, they attract all the beetles in, but they only catch about 60% of them. So the other 40% go on to your roses. So I'm going to put it over in my neighbor's garden and not tell them, say, I'm going to tell them, I'm doing you a favor. Um, never mind. So it doesn't always work the way you think it's going to. The other thing is, uh, as was mentioned, Carlos mentioned, I'm working here in Brazil. And we're working on, this is a transgenic corn plant and is attacked by the um, uh, fall armyworm. 
and it has become resistant to the Bt uh, toxin that's in the corn plant. And we have several resistant ones, but in the one we finished working on and we're about to publish, we looked at, we asked the question, like if you become resistant, insecticide resistance for example, you find that the resistant caterpillars take longer to develop, which means they're exposed to parasitoids or predators for a longer period of time. When they're adults, they're tinier, which means they have lower fecundity. They can't fly as well, they're not as sexy. So there's a cost, but the benefit is you don't die when they spray insecticides. So there is a cost to your reproductive output, but there is a gain. So we asked the question, what about the emission of sex pheromone and the responses? And we expected that the resistant ones would produce less pheromone, they wouldn't spend as much time doing it, and the males wouldn't be very good at responding. Oh dear. We created supermen and superwomen. The females call more, they put out more sex pheromone. The males respond to the same, uh, the, the resistant females more than the uh, native, the, un, uh, the susceptible ones, which means we're going to get assorted of mating, which means we're going, the pheromone traps don't work anymore. Not so good, but that's biology. That's why we keep our jobs. The other thing is um, here you have these aphids, and when they are attacked, they release a compound called beta-farnesine, which is an alarm pheromone. And so what they thought was, and this is a group in England uh, at Rothamsted, what they thought they would do, this is an aphid releasing an alarm pheromone when it's disturbed, and they said if we had plants that emitted the alarm pheromone, two things would happen. Fewer aphids would stay on the plant, because they're going, this is a dangerous place. But this alarm pheromone also attracts natural enemies. So they said we would have fewer aphids, more natural enemies, lower damage. In the laboratory, it works wonderfully. In the field, no difference at all. So we have a long way to go, but we have a lot of possibilities. But in closing, I would leave you with one thought. McDonald's. This is a, you know, this is communication. Everybody around the world knows this sign. It is the second best recognized sign in the world after Coca-Cola. No, Apple hasn't got, I, be, I wouldn't be surprised actually if, that, if they did the survey now. But it is Coca-Cola is the first, McDonald's is the second. It was mentioned in the beginning that I got my undergraduate degree at the University of Western Ontario in 1969. I went back there as a professor a few years ago. In 1967, the first McDonald's opened in London, Ontario. And it was a new phenomenon. So within 60 years, this thing has gone around the world and is recognized. And everybody's clever. We are so good human beings. Well, I'm sorry, insects did it first, they did it thousands of years beforehand, and they are actually edible. So the one thing you have to keep in mind, I don't care how smart we think we are, when it comes to things like insects, there are a lot of species, they have a lot of diversity, and it is always going to be a challenge. So we have to keep an open mind and realize that, yes, we need to fight against those that are considered pests, but we need scientists. We need people that think. We need the chemists. We need the physiologists. We need the molecular biologists. This is a wonderful area. And it's always going to be there, because every time, it's like a game of chess. You know, it's an arms war. I find a way, I find a way against it. And so it goes. Thank you very much. Obrigado.